glycemic control need to be carefully monitored and closely watched and need to be treated aggressively with a strict glycemic control which also is known to prevent the progression of the proteinuria and diabetic nephropathy correct hyperphosphatemia in the patient by giving calcium citrate regularly which is a phosphate binder and you need to give long term oral calcium and vitamin D to prevent secondary hyperparathyroidism in the patient of CKD and you need to treat the acidosis by giving bicarbonate these are all the part of the management and you need to give erythropoietin injections to manage the anemia so ultimately when your chronic kidney disease patient comes to you regularly to your OP for a follow up what are the things that you will do like a aeroplane uh, flight checking you need to do all these things prescription is very regular routine prescription how is his anemia does he need uh, erythropoietin how is his acidosis does he need bicarbonate how is his calcium does he need a phosphate binder does he need vitamin D there will be some 8 to 10 things which are the part of the prescription of a CKD patient whenever he comes for a follow up but giving them carefully monitoring the patient artfully and preventing the progression of ESRD is all about the art and science of managing patients of CKD then whenever required you need to plan for dialysis renal transplantation these are all the things that need to be done a patient of CKD suddenly has infection pneumonia he may go suddenly into acute on chronic renal failure then he may develop severe uncontrollable hyperkalemia acidosis etc then you need to dialysis to temporarily salvage the patient from an acute crisis so that is another important part of the management of CKD so what are the life threatening complications in a patient of CKD hyperkalemia pulmonary edema infection etc etc now let us have a quick short notes on dialysis which is a renal replacement therapy two things two two things are called renal replacement therapy what are they renal transplant and dialysis these two are called renal replacement therapy now dialysis during dialysis what are we doing we pass the blood of the patient which is rich in urea phosphate everything to pass through a interface which acts like a filter just like the glomerulus it will filter out all the toxins purifies the blood and given back to the patient so that is the underlying uh, philosophy behind doing dialysis the two common methods are hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis then between the two there is another option which is called chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis that means patient will say I am a senator I am a member of parliament I can't come and sit in your dialysis unit and get my hemodialysis done people are waiting for me there are so many scams to be completed so then as a nephrologist what will you tell no problem sir you can go anywhere in the world we will put you a peritoneal conduit which automatically will do dialysis for you which is called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis is a way by which patient can live normal life carry it along with him and get the dialysis continuously done so that's called CAPD chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis when you want to consider dialysis suppose patient says my aunt's husband's second wife's third son who is there in America is coming back to give me kidney doctor he will take another six months to come 
until his kidney matches me and you put it back into me please manage my uremia so there is a phase of bridging between definitive renal replacement in the form of renal transplant from the point of the renal failure as that bridge you need to do dialysis then if there is an acute renal failure dialysis may be transiently required if his pulmonary edema hyperkalemia acidosis are unmanageable then there are certain drugs which are dialyzable drugs when there is an intoxication because of those drugs then that becomes an indication for dialysis so common question asked is absolute and specific indications of dialysis absolute severe acidosis with which is intractable patient comes in 6.8 6.7 6.5 ph serum ph indication hyperkalemia unmanageable in spite of your dextrose insulin calcium gluconate beta to agonistic drugs potassium purging out resins hyperkalemia persists indication absolute indication for dialysis lithium aspirin methanol ethylene glycol like dialyzable intoxications and poisoning dialysis is indicated if there is a hypervolemia with a severe pulmonary edema not responding to your diuretic therapy in spite of 2 to 3 hours patient is in gasping then indication for dialysis similarly severe uremia leading to uremic pericarditis is also an absolute indication for dialysis is what need to be remembered then there are certain non emergent emergent indications for the dialysis non emergent means a little relaxedly you can decide dialysis suppose if the patient is having high creatinine high blood urea let us say creatinine is 5 or 6 do you want to run and do dialysis for him not required you go to the opd nephrology op you check 5 to 6 patients uh, creatinine value your heart stops beating somebody will have 5 or 6 and there will have 7 or 8 but don't think that they will all be in that acidotic state and uh, a dying state they will be stable kidney function will be there in spite of such a high creatinine so the mere creatinine and urea levels doesn't decide the decision of dialysis is what you need to remember then if nausea vomiting lethargy pericarditis the symptoms of uremia are bad then that is a non emergent indication for doing the dialysis then what are the emergent indications as we discussed pulmonary edema hypertension hyperkalemia hypermagnesemia or any drug intoxication they are all the emergent indications so absolute non emergent emergent indications of dialysis but what is the most important thing you are not going to forget you are going to highlight and write it in the tomorrow's exam creatinine by itself as a value is not an indication of the absolute indication for dialysis is what you need to remember so you have a bigger list this is a smaller list so once more in february when you come for uh, preparation to need pg we will give you bigger list for now small list are enough for passing mbbs exams so salicylate lithium ethylene glycol and magnesium containing laxatives they are all highly dialyzable now few comments about hemo and peritoneal dialysis what do you do in hemo dialysis patient's blood is pumped by an artificial pump outside the body through a dialyzer which contain a lot of networks of semi permeable membranes the dialyte will flow to the outside of the body through these networks and then all the toxic substances are being sucked out and whenever the blood is leaves the body it has a tendency to clot hence what we do we do significant heparinization to prevent the clotting when the blood is passing through the dialysis and uh, it uh, a patient typically will require 3 to 5 hours of dialysis 3 days per week don't you think life is pathetic 
three days a week you need to go to the dialysis center and sit for three to five hours to get the dialysis done very terrible but let me tell you patients get habituated and as a nephrologist you also get habituated so that's the reason where should uh, prevention is better than cure try all your ways to prevent progression of diabetes into diabetic nephropathy that's the thing you need to do in OPD when you sit with your patient you need to take another half an hour of time to talk to him if you fail in that job then the patient will land in the hands of a nephrologist where he need to invest three to five hours of time for three days a week to get a continuous dialysis now every time he goes to the dialysis center will you puncture his vessel and then suck the blood out and push it into the dialysis machine no you can't so you need to create one permanent conduit for sucking out the blood of his body and then pushing it back into the body so you create what is called arteriovenous fistula by which you will take out the blood from his uh, body pass to the dialysis machine and then once more put it back into the patient's body so for this you need to create what is called a arteriovenous fistula which is done by generally vascular surgeon colleague and in some hospitals nephrologist himself will do this and uh, once you create a fistula what is the challenge for you because when you take out the blood it should come out from the vein when you push it back it need to go into artery so what is the challenge for you when you create AV fistula it can it can clot you must check the patency of AV fistula is another important thing so you have a venous pressure monitor you have a air trap and air detector you get the clean blood going back and this is how you have a heparin pump to prevent clotting and this is a typical diazolate is what need to be remembered <coughs> of course when you ask your classmates in uh, engineering they will say how will you study even at the age of 25 26 so many big big books they are all enjoying in a discotheque then you will tell him I am like a nephrology dialysis patient every day I go to reading room and put my brain like an AV fistula and then study so a chronic state of studying 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 made us to live like a uh, what you call um, a, a, a bookworm living in the reading rooms <clears throat>